Facebook side in case there are some issues. Faith Radio. Okay. That's there. All right, it's showing live. Now I'm going to the, do the supremely uncomfortable thing of watching myself in live video, just to double check. <laughs> uh, do we smooth it? No, I mean, unless you want to. Yeah, of course. But you have to do it from with this. Okay. Yes, both of us are here. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, right, one person's here. For the one person, we will begin. <laughs> uh, my name is Deacon Nicholas Kotar. I blog at A Light So Lovely, creating Christian culture for a post-Christian America over at the Ancient Faith, Faith blogging platform. And I am very pleased and honored to have taken over the Ancient Faith Radio uh, Facebook page in order to have a conversation, an interview, if you will, with Father John Strickland, author of the new Ancient Faith book, The Age of Paradise. Father John, it's a wonderful uh, it's wonderful to see you after many missteps and technological disasters. We are finally here, and I'm very happy to, to see you joining me here, and I'm looking forward to our conversation very much. Yeah, it's good to be here, Deacon Nicholas. Thanks for having me. Well, let me tell you a little bit, uh, you and and the people who are here, about how I uh, have, have come to have encountered you out in the wild, so to speak. But um, I'm not sure exactly how it was that I was introduced to your uh, podcast, but that's how I first came to know you. And I started to listen to it, and immediately I was taken by the uh, positive view of history that it was presenting, uh, the positive view of the church's history, that seem that seemed to go out of its way. You seem to go out of your way to accentuate certain aspects of our history that were some that are sometimes minimized by the more literal or dogmatic minded, which I which I immediately found to be very pleasant. Then I noticed that you had published a book with uh, Jordanville uh, Press, uh, the Holy Tr Holy Trinity. Um, I, I think I guess it's the it's not the Seminary Press, but the Monastery Press called. Um, Oh gosh, I don't remember what it's called. It's about something about Holy Russia. I know that, and I haven't read it yet. To my great chagrin and detriment, I will read it at some point um, because this is a subject very near to my heart, and I'm embarrassed not to have read it. Um, and then uh, I was very pleased to receive an email from Catherine Hyde, who's the um, uh, acquiring editor for Ancient Faith pub Publishing, uh, to ask me if I would be willing to edit *The Age of Paradise*. Uh, and I immediately jumped on the opportunity and. I was absolutely enthralled from page one, uh, and I had a wonderful time editing it, and I'm very, very happy to see it finally in print. Um, so, Father John, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became a podcaster with Ancient Faith um, and eventually a writer for them. Sure. Yeah, Deacon Nicholas, thank you. Well, I, um, I be, long before I even became a priest, when seminary became a priest, I was teaching history at the university, and and uh, after once at seminary and then beyond, I continued doing that. And I found myself down in Los Angeles for a time, really wanting to go further than I had at that point just in teaching classes. I wanted to you know, really write something. I'd written my doctoral dissertation. That's the uh, base for the uh, book you just mentioned, The Making of Holy Russia. And, and at that time, I, um, I, I had the opportunity to publish it with Holy Trinity, and so I did that. But beyond that, I was uh, really wanted to to bring a lot of the teaching research uh, that I've been doing already uh, into kind of book form. And thought, well, you know, a good way of doing this, as I do my research and all. Of course, I'm a full time parish priest, as I do this, you know, at first, so uh, it can only be done on the side, as it were. Yeah. But I, I I really found the idea of a podcast um, a, a good way of of doing that, and so. Um, I started that project just about the time when I moved from uh, being a parish priest in Los Angeles to teaching at St. Catherine College down there in what's now um, San Marcos uh, in the San Diego area yeah. and started the podcast there. About five years ago, I moved up here to uh, Washington to Western Puget Sound. I'm in Polto at our Orthodox Church here in St. Elizabeth and, and um, continued the podcast. Uh, so the podcast was designed, I kind of think of it as a, um, a researcher's notebook. 
it's mm. it's an effort to be able to do more than just just think more than just write notes in my workbook that I keep for the book series, but uh, to actually you know articulate it you know well enough that until you you articulate something you don't really know if you understand it or not yeah. um the best way to learn something is to teach it <laughs> so um so i i started the podcast with that in mind i thought it was you know um interesting stuff and i, I wanted to share it with the ancient faith uh the audience and so i started that and boy that was um that was back in 2013 so i guess it's uh really been a long time six years since i started it yeah, wow. um, when I was down at the college, I was doing it, you know, very regularly and then more irregularly once I returned to full-time pastoral uh, work here in Washington. But I completed the second half, the first two parts of it, and uh, had to put it aside in order to start actually writing the book that I had in mind all along. And, and that book, uh, the first, um, first volume of that book is uh, The Age of Paradise. That's kind of how it, how it came into being. So the, the theme of paradise and utopia is, I think, a very important one for many reasons. So what prompted you to approach it specifically in, in book form for the age of paradise? And more specifically, what do you hope to accomplish with, with this book? And or should I say with all four of them as their four volumes planned, as I understand? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my goal is to, uh, I guess there are really three things I want to do with the book series. And it's not much different with the podcast, although they are really different projects and maybe we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about the differences between the podcast and the book series. But um, the book series really has three goals and one of them is simply to tell history uh, for the sheer enjoyment and interest of telling history. I think history is uh, fascinating, obviously. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and history of the church, but in particular my project, the history of the culture produced and influenced by the church, I think is really an interesting um, study and it's worth just doing on its own. So that's the first goal is just to produce an interesting history that's readable, that's accessible, it's not you know too scholarly, but it also does bring some scholarly insight into, into things. And the second goal uh, is to be able to say something about the culture we live in today, which you know I've always is really to understand what happened in the history of the West to make what was once, and in some cases still is, a Christian civilization into one that's so uh, often a hostile to Christianity. And so I wanted to um, contribute to a project that really was receiving attention from a lot of other writers. Uh, a lot of people probably in your audience recognize the name Rod Dreher and his, his book, I think it's a bestseller, it's um, yeah. uh, the, the Benedict Option. And there are other books out there similar to this that were recently published that are kind of, you know, books written in the um, aftermath of the so-called culture wars, uh, yeah. when Christians are, are kind of dealing with the fact that we are under siege in our culture. And um, and I wanted to understand why that happened, how that happened. And I wanted, really as an historian, to contribute to, to, the, to the discussion about um, a post-Christian society um, from an historical point of view. And, and one of the things my podcast, but especially now the books are, are doing, are is, is taking the narrative way back beyond what almost anyone else ever um, um, really uh, uses as the start point for the decline of Christian civilization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's, that's the second. The third and final main goal for the, uh, for the book series, for Paradise and Utopia, is to be able to do it from an Eastern Christian, or in my case, specifically Orthodox Christian point of view. Uh, too often histories of Christendom, cr Christian civilization, Christian culture, the culture wars, these things, um, they're written from a Western point of view for obvious reasons, and um, Protestant, Roman Catholic, um, and uh, and I wanted to bring an Orthodox um, perspective on this. And, and so my book, um, uh, the Age of Paradise is the first of several, you know, four, four in all uh, books that will really place an Eastern point of view foremost in making sense of uh, what has happened with Christian culture, Chris, Christendom over the centuries. This may be a, a too too broad a question to ask or to to expect a concise answer for, but maybe the best answer would be read the books. But my my uh, my question, my immediate question is. 
what is it about the Orthodox perspective that is so, first of all, different from the Western one? And secondly, why is it so important to be telling it from this perspective? So is there something lacking in the Western perspective? Or is it, well, I, I won't lead you. Why don't you answer that in any way you like? <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And, and, and I'll say, you know, before I answer that, that there's a lot that's in common. So I, I don't, you know, reject, you know, somehow the, the Western point of view when I, um, when I encounter it or retell it, but <clears throat> some of the basic um, differences, I think, uh, Deacon Nicholas, are that the Western point of view, uh, you know, is, is, you know, as Orthodox in America, we often find, don't we, that Roman Catholicism and Protestantism tend to be two sides of the same coin. Yep. But for people from either of those points of view, it they, they seem opposite, they seem totally different. Um, and, um, and we Orthodox, we see them both really as being part of a family that has a common heritage and that heritage by the time, you know, of the 20th century, 21st century has really kind of solidified an interpretation of, of, of the history of Christian culture that sees certain things as being, you know, the most important, the most formative um, events in the uh, decline of, of Christian culture. And this book is not just about decline, but, yeah. um, but, but to take that, you know, they would say, you know, the sexual revolution is the most important thing that happened. Uh, some of them might go back further and they might talk. I mean, one great book that's out there, it's called Bad Religion. That's a great title. Um, Bad Religion um, by Ross Dotha. That is a study of uh, what happened to American Protestantism in particular. He's Roman Catholic um, in the 20th century that just made it, you know, go in the direction it went. And one might go back further to his point of view that this all happened in the mid 20th century. One could go back further and look at the Enlightenment and think how the Enlightenment impacted Roman Catholic and Protestant theology. Um, in his book, The Benedict Option, I think Rod likes to uh, locate the beginning of the problem with um, the rise of nominalism in the late Middle Ages, the 15th yeah. century, uh, 14th century. And, and those are all good points. I mean, they're all very important um, moments. But what I think an Orthodox perspective offers that these these Western ones simply can't or are not interested in or simply are <clears throat> just blind to is is um, is a view of things that takes the the narrative all the way back to the first millennium, which is what yeah. my first volume does, Age of Paradise. It's a history of Christendom up until the Great Schism, just before the Great Schism. And during that first millennium, I think we see the really authentic, fundamental features of what we can call a Christian civilization with a supporting culture. And um, and and then it's after that, that um, especially with the beginning of the Great Schism, that we begin to see um, developments take place in the West. Some of them take place in the East as well, I'd say, but in the West especially that um, are detrimental to a healthy Christian culture and um, put in motion, may take centuries for them to play out, but put in motion um, um, developments that will slowly uh, lead to a decline in the strength of that, that Christian culture. That's what an Orthodox point of view can do is it can really you know, take it back to the very earliest times, and that's still half of the whole history, the first millennium, and get started there. So this, this, I mean, I'm, I'm immensely fascinated by the history of that particular period, and there was so much in your book that, that I was surprised by, even though I'm seminary educated and I read for my own pleasure. But there were, it seems to me that even some existing Orthodox uh, narratives, especially of the first century, tend to pick very specific sides. And I'm, I am, I am talking about Father Alexander Schmemann's book in particular. Um, I, I, I have sort of mixed feelings about it. Um, I, I find some things that are, that are positive about it, some things that are not so positive. But with all of these books, one thing that I, that I keep uh, bumping up against is a question, how do we get from the theory of studying the interesting facts that, of our past, how do we go from there to actually implementing maybe the lessons of history for today is there how do you see that process playing out hmm. so the book you're you're thinking about is his uh, famous uh uh for the life of the world is that the one uh, i'm thinking of his his um his history of the church 
I can't remember what oh, it's okay. called. Okay, that one, that short one volume. The short one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've read that, but I, I did read that. And so your question is, um, could you just rephrase it? Well, it's even the Orthodox perspective seems to approach the the problems of Christian culture uh, in different ways. So um, Father Alexander was was decidedly anti-imperial. Um, you you tend to pick sides less and provide a lot more of a nuanced look at at the first century, not being afraid to look at both the warts and the glory, so to speak. But how do we get, this is something that I've oft, often thought about, and I'm not sure how to do it, but how do we get from a mere examination of the facts of the past or, or a theory of how these things may have happened, and how do we go from that, from the study of history, to a practical change in our reality? Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. I, I think, you know, I think that, First of all, looking at the warts, you know, acknowledging those warts is really healthy and, and helpful, you know, because if we create some sort of a fantasy, you know, if we just uh, cherry pick events and things from the past that we like the most and we kind of ignore the bad stuff, you know, we, we, we do. don't, what's that? Which we do sometimes. <laughs> we do. I mean, we, yeah, but we do. I mean, I, I certainly... You know, I have to choose some things to talk about, and that uh, those those uh, those choices are to some extent influenced by my preferences. But you know, I mean, you mentioned the age of paradise. I think one of the things I try to be honest about is is the real problems of Eastern Christendom. Um, and by the way, I make a distinction between Eastern uh, between Christendom and the Church. And I want your audience to be aware if they haven't read the book that when I use the word Christendom, I'm not talking about the Church. Uh, and so I'm talking about a culture or civilization influenced by the church. And of course, the two overlap tremendously, but I, I want to make that distinction. Eastern Christendom had all sorts of problems uh, and, uh, you know, I, you know, iconoclasm and, and the Byzantine state with its brutal ways of, of doing things, you know, and, and all sorts of other stuff could be mentioned there, Caesar papism. Um, and so I, you know, I think it's it's good to be able to you know name that I acknowledge that and uh, and that'll help us today I mean, because especially today I think one of the things Schmemann was so aware of when he used he said he you know you you kind of uh, suggested he had a kind of anti empire or imperial um, kind of uh, way of looking at things and I think I agree with you I see what you mean in that I think he was profoundly sensitive to the fact that we live in America I mean wasn't he obviously so concerned with with providing Orthodox Christians in America the means of affirming our faith and not having to be, you know, complete cultural, you know, fish out of water. Yeah. And I think uh, and I think that that was helpful. I think maybe it's possible to go too far um, in that direction. It's possible to miss some of the good things that are to be found in the past in in uh, in in forms of Christendom that were. Or, you know, a powerful, centralized, even auto autocratic government was in place. Um, I tend to often, um, I find when I talk to people to be a little bit more favorable towards, say, the Russian experience in history, that was my area of study, um, than a lot of people, you know, you turn on the news today and Russia, e you know, equals Putin, which equals, you know, tyranny, which blah, 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 and it goes on from there. But there's a lot of good that actually, you know, was oh, done. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, can I throw thing out, one thing out? I mean, I love to say this to students. You know, it took us Americans with our democracy, the worst mm -hmm. war we ever fought. Uh, I think 600,000 people were killed in the Civil War to liberate um, people from slavery. Mm -hmm. And um, and and in, in Russia, at exactly the same time, I think our Emancipation Proclamation, you know, it came out just about the time that Alexander yeah. II's Emancipation yeah. Edict was written. Yeah, yeah. That took a signature and we were done. You know, the yeah, serfs were free. That's right. that's right. 50 million of them, you know, mm -hmm. 10 times the number of slaves freed in America because of our democracy. And I'm not, you know, obviously that's a good thing, democracy. But you, you, I guess my point is simply other forms of government can also, for the historian anyway, you know, be interesting and, and have their own validity. It doesn't have to be one or the other. And um, in studying history, uh, you know, along with Schmeim and I, I have a lot, you know, of criticism to make, I guess, about forms of government that we no longer have in America that we shouldn't try to just hang on to or have a romantic attachment to. 
Um, but I do see a lot of value there, and, I, and I, I'm not, not able to just dismiss that to make it relevant to our own time. Yeah, well, this this is an important point that you're making about about looking at history through not simply what what is an impartial lens because nobody can be purely impartial no matter how yeah. no matter how we relate to what we call the scientific method no matter how we think we can look at you know the data or the primary sources in an impartial way we always bring a tremendous amount of personal and, and cultural baggage along with how we how we interpret what we what we read and what we learn and i find that this is a particularly important problem that we have right now with the culture um even even in the orthodox culture so to speak because and and you're just because you're because we seem to be looking not for paradise but for utopia and even even when we're not thinking about it many people many people especially people who are politically active amongst the orthodox amongst the non-orthodox it doesn't matter amongst the non-orthodox some would argue some uh, some people quite eloquently would argue that you know s s that the new religion is uh, in our world is politics. Andrew Sullivan, in particular, for the New York Magazine, I'm thinking, had a wonderful piece about that um, about a year or two ago. But what is it about that d the distinction then between paradise and utopia that so many of us seem to be getting wrong? Well, you know, I mean, the point about politics being the new religion is interesting. I. Um, I haven't read what you just uh, alluded to, um, but in the book, you know, in the introduction to Age of Paradise, I do make the comment um, that the two basic differences in, in between paradise and utopia, between a paradisi paradisiacal culture that directs attention toward the kingdom of heaven beyond this world, even if it is in this world, through the life of the church, and a utopia which has given up on a kingdom of heaven, and living for that, and simply sees this world as being the, um, you know, the, the 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 kind of boundaries by which people should try to live their lives and develop with her. The difference really is between, um, um, you know, if you think about culture as shaping time and public rituals that are shaped by time and set in time. Think about, <laughs> think about uh, Great Lent. Think about the period of fasting and repentance. Um, we Orthodox really love to emphasize how joyful this time is, how bright and, and beautiful is mm -hmm. this time, how transformative it is. Um, but yeah. it's a time of repentance um, and, and it happens every year. <clears throat> and once Christianity uh, really became influential in, uh, in, in the history of the West, that was a yearly event that was under the influence of Christianity shaping public life and it's a measure of time compare that to utopia where today we have if not every year and we do actually every year but especially every four years we have that public ritual of the election campaign right and so and 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 think of the differences in in, in what is going on in our culture um great lent if done properly is a time of repentance it's a time of inward um repentance of sins and a inward joy at the uh the, the prodigal sons return to the father and experience of the uh, fatted calf and the and the hall prepared for us uh, yeah. in the presence of God. Whereas the election cycle, you know, it doesn't have repentance as its uh, theme. It has indignation, yeah. right? How bad things are and how good they could be if just we vote for the right person who, you know, often just, you know, at some level wants power and wants influence. So it's a, it's a, almost the opposite, it seems to me. It, it takes the inward looking um, and and spiritually healthy process of repentance and it re transforms it into the outward looking and spiritually very often harmful um, human uh, desire to judge and condemn and and, uh, and 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 set oneself against others to create a better society. So is this an inherent problem with a worldview that sets as its goal a utopia? Yeah, I think it is. But what's interesting is, I think, and this is going to come out in the uh, in the book series. It's already started to come out in the in the second half of the podcast on ancient faith. Um, what I see, and this is this is kind of why I started the podcast, is to kind of test the theory, test the, the hypothesis. What I see is that when after the Great Schism, um, the paradisiacal culture of of ancient Christendom. 
um, what I call paradisiacal Christendom before the in the first millennium. Once in the West, that was more and more distant and and obscured by new developments and in in, um, in the papal reformation. I'm actually in volume two right now, writing my uh, chap second chapter on the papal reformation, where the papacy became a very important part of Western Christendom. When new patterns of piety developed and uh, doctrines like purgatory began to bring attention to the um, often miserable condition of the human race. Uh, pope uh, Innocent III famously writes a book before he becomes pope called um, the, 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 um, the Misery of the Human Condition. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and when that becomes really strong, and of course we know Luther was reacting to this miserable and fearsome um, threat hanging over the human race in Christianity yeah. as he understood it, and the Reformation sprang out of this. Well, I think what happens, Deacon Nicholas, is that um, a culture that had been shaped to desire what I call paradise, the kingdom of heaven, and had been en encouraged to find that experience of paradise in this world because of the incarnation and the effects on uh, the cosmology of Christendom because of the incarnation, when this world no longer provided the experience of the kingdom of heaven, of paradise to people, but people were still living within a system um, where they they were trained to think that human life, you know, as we saw with Great Lent, is about transformation and yeah. acquiring something more than this world in its natural condition, its, un, its spiritually untransformed condition can offer. People, and Martin Luther, I think, was one of them, uh, turned to something very different. And even more than Luther, the generation of the Renaissance humanists uh, simply seem to have lost confidence or faith in the Western Christendom they had been uh, raised within. But they didn't lose the desire for paradise, or at least its secularized form, which we can call utopia. And that's the birth of utopia, as I understand it. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me. And what's inter what's interesting, though, is that for all for all of what you're saying about Western Christendom, um, there is there has always been a streak of extreme asceticism in 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 Orthodox thought and in Orthodox culture, so much so that somebody like the Russian philosopher Ivan Ilyin, actually in his in his little book called The Foundations of Christian Culture, goes so far as to say that there is a kind of undercurrent uh, of Gnostic thought within uh, the Orthodox Church's um, theory of of the acceptance of the world that has never really been extirpated and this this is the reality that i think a lot of us assume when we think about how we're supposed to relate to the world this is one of the w w wonderful things about your podcast for me initially is is how how you chose quite correctly i think to emphasize the fact that christianity's worldview is essentially in embracing of the world because of the incarnation but to me when i first started listening to it it was almost a shock to the system i don't know whether it's me being russian or what but uh, i think many of us are are maybe it's the, our american puritan past i don't know but many of us are by default by default have a kind of oh we can't accept the world we must distance ourselves from it and yet ilian says very clearly that if we allow this sort of tradition of he calls it he goes so, so far as to call it gnostic dualism to persist in the orthodox mindset then christian culture will never be reborn he goes so far as to say that do you agree with him yeah if i understand you just say that Ilyin was 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 conscious of a gnostic tendency that 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 tended to um see the world in a dualistic sense the world yeah. is kind of fallen broken corrupted all that stuff and and the real the the real life of a christian is 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 of course as we know not of this world yes i think that he's he's on to something i mean in fact you know he's he and he he's he's much more i mean he's got so much more to say about it than i do so it's kind of silly for me to um you know even, even to comment on him but but i think that that is my intuition too in in as an historian and and that is that because of the incarnation, um, we Christians were were given a gospel that that revealed to us that this world is filled with the presence of God, filled with the presence of the incarnate God. 
that within the body of Christ, as we understand it, the church, um, the sacraments of the church um, enable us to participate in the kingdom of heaven, even now in this in its life in this world. Yeah. And I argue in the book, and I believe very strongly that that is the basis for a healthy Christian civilization, um, a healthy Christian culture. That is exactly what was, I think, lost or at least weakened in the West after the schism. When the West lost contact with the uh, with the with the East, when the West started going through a really dramatic transformations in its character, and the, that created a crisis of a unitary um, Christian culture that uh, opened the door for what you're you're saying Ilian said was a, a dualistic um, understanding of Christian culture, and uh, you know I think about the, the great work um, you know that's being done by Father Stephen Freeman you know with his his model of a, a one story versus a two story universe. And, yes, and yes. I, I've learned so much from him. His, his, his uh, blog on ancient faith is just really phenomenal. And yeah. um, that's, I think that's, that's kind of a similar way of thinking about it that I, that I have is that with the Protestant Reformation and the Enlightenment, you, you really get this, this sense of um, God is no longer really present here. The sacramental life of the church is greatly, you know, diminished in some forms of Protestantism. And um, and as a result, you get a, a, a dualistic understanding of the world. And that is a problem. And until we can, we can understand God's presence in this world, I think we are going to have a hard time revitalizing the culture that surrounds us. And in my, one of my projects, the second point I made about the, you know, the, the goals I had in writing this book was to be able to contribute something to the discussion of rebuilding a Christian culture today by bringing attention to the sacral um, and you might say incarnational character of Christian culture. Because that that's an aspect that gets so often ignored or even undercut, unfortunately, by some of our own clergy. And I, the, the emergence of certain narratives, shall we say, in, in the Orthodox blogosphere or the, or the Orthodox intranet, especially recently with Father Andrew Stephen Damick's new podcast on, on the Lord of the Rings and kind of looking at it from a Christian, especially Orthodox perspective, has really put into stark um, relief the, the fact and reality that there is a whole vocal subset of, of the Orthodox world that considers secular or any sort of earthly culture to be completely irrelevant. And Ilian talks about this too in his book. He says this is one of the two possible options you have in a world that is post-Christian. One is you transform the culture, and the other one you ignore it completely as being unchristian. And unfortunately, I'm seeing a lot more of the latter um, happening right now. And um, so mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you think then that um, – how do you think then – people can look to help move this conversation in the right direction? Well, I, I think, you know, I think, Deacon Nicholas, that we have the answers in our past. We have the answers, uh, especially in the first millennium, but but well after that, too, because uh, even after, you know, Byzantium was wiped out in the 15th century, um, we still have the Russian uh, civilization that, that keeps much of it alive. I, I think we have it today. I mean, we don't need a great Orthodox power to to show this. We have this every time we go to the, the liturgy, right? But we have this in our sacramental liturgical life as Orthodox Christians, a life which, by the way, you know, Roman Catholics share in, in some at some level and, and some Protestants as well. And I think when we when we look at that, we find that you know, I'm not I'm not I'm not sure you know, you made an allusion to the blogosphere there. I don't doubt that there's you know lots of different stuff that's being said. If if one of the things being said is Christians have no business in this culture, we should just kind of abandon it, let it go to hell, you know, and, and yep. focus on our relationship with God. I mean, that's an extreme point of view that most Protestants probably wouldn't really sign on to uh, unless they're very dogmatic about it. Yeah. It, it, there's some basis for it, obviously, in, in the Christian revelation. Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know, I, in my in my uh, book, the first chapter of The Age of Paradise, I, I spent some time talking about the Gospel of John and the place of the word world, cosmos, in it. Yeah. And it's true. You know, you can find there and elsewhere, you know, 
um, friendship with the Lord, the world is enmity with God and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's not John, but you can find statements about how broken this world is, right? You know, mm -hmm. you, Jesus says in the Gospel of John that, you know, the world will hate his disciples because it hated him. That's all very true and very important for us as Christians to remember. We do not belong to this world. We This is not our, this is not our destiny. Uh, we are not of this world. However, um, the same gospel also says God so loved the cosmos, gave to his only begotten son. I think if we're to be Christians, we have to love the world. <laughs> and that's not something people are uh, very often, you know, uh, yeah. familiar, you know, think think about saying. But yeah. loving the world means not to sell out to it. It means to transform it, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into it, to transform it by the power of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven revealed by Christ and his Holy Spirit. And I think that's what a Christian is called to do culturally. And that is the first of the two options you, you brought attention to there a moment ago when you summarized this problem. I think the transformation of the world is what our calling is as Christians. And, and I think we Orthodox, especially in, in, in America, in, in North America, in the West, um, have a remarkably um, um, uh, a timely, um, a calling or ministry um, to a commission to to play a role in this. Yeah, I I, I couldn't agree more. And and it's Ilian. I'm going to be talking a lot about Ilian just because I love him so much. But he he says that 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 this transformation is the gospel teaches us to take to to take all of the sciences, the arts, everything that we that the world gives us, and use them as hands with which to transform the world instead of cutting off those hands as if they were useless. <laughs> Uh, which is such a lovely image. I just, I, I love to, I, I love to ruminate on that often. Um, you did yeah. say something there that I couldn't help, but, um, well, I'll explain. You said the answers are in our past. Yes, of course, I completely agree. But if our past is told by people like Bart Ehrman, or by uh, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and by narratives that are much more easily accessed in large, you know, mass market editions by people who have less interest in perhaps, well, I don't know, what is their interest? Are they the ones telling the right history? Are we? And how are people supposed to tell the difference? Is there a, a true history of the world and where can we find it? Well, I think there is a true history. I mean, history is story, right? So the Greek word historia, it means, I mean, that's what we say when we say history. So history is a arranging of the past so that it's intelligible and more than intelligible, compelling, interesting, um, exciting, you know, whatever, beautiful. And and so, yeah, so so it, it, it's, it's up to us as living people, as people alive, thinking about the, the, the culture, the problems we have in our own generation, to look to the past and to find in the past um, material and events and developments and all that stuff that is relevant and helpful to us. And so um, there is a true story, there is a true history. And, you know, I, I often like to, to point out that, you know, even, even the evangelist Luke, you know, was an historian Book of Acts is the first history of the church. You often heard it, hear it said that Eusebius is a father of Christian, you know, history or history or historiography. No, the evangelist Luke was, and in his book of the Acts of the Apostles, he doesn't, you know, it's not, it's not a uh, chronography or chronology. It's not just this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, and you know, I don't really know what any of it means. It's just this stuff happened. He puts it together. It starts yeah. in Jerusalem and ends in Rome. It starts yes. with Peter and ends with Paul. It starts right. with a very small religion and ends, you know, conquering the world. You know, yeah. it's yeah. it's brilliantly put together, and 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 so Luke is, you know, offering his intelligence and his ability to write. You know, scholars. I'm not a Greek scholar, but scholarly, the 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 polish of his Greek is really really nice. It's good good well written Greek. He made it beautiful. He made it compelling. He made it interesting. And he presented us with a vision, offering his intelligence to God and cooperating with God um, as a saint in, in putting together a history that is the truth. It's the true story. He could have chosen other things, but but this is this is the story. And I think that's what we have to try to do as best as we can is practicing asceticism and 
praying and, and trying to be part of the life of the, the church to which we belong. I think we need also, we who are historians anyway, we need to try to offer, you know, our talent, whatever it is, to this effort to make sense of the world and uh, and to glorify God in doing. And there is a true story in all of that. Yeah, I completely agree. And it occurs to me as you, as you as you talk, and mentioning the fact that history is story, it the historians work in a lot of ways. I think intersects with the, with the novelists, um, especially in something that the fantasy the fantasy writers call world building, which for those who don't know is a is a kind of general term that refers to a f especially fantasy or science fiction uh, writers' ability or even um, imprimatur to create or subcreate, as Tolkien would have it, an entire world with its own internally <clears throat> consistent laws uh, that is, reflects in some way the real world. Now, do you do you think that this sort of element of world building has any place in the telling of history? And if yes, what sort of world are you trying to build for your listeners and for your readers? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, a lot to a lot of a lot to be compared between historiography and and uh, fiction. Let's call it fiction, novel writing, you know. Um, and um, I, I think, I think both are concerned with reality. I, I mean, I'm going to let you talk about what a author of fiction, you know, thinks about and what he thinks fiction should be. But it seems to me what fiction is. Um, and I think, and you know, if I had more talent, I would be a novelist, not an historian. <laughs> but it's easy, you know. They say that you know those who who can't do teach and. And I think when it comes to authors, those who can't really invent anything tell the past. You know? <laughs> so, but but I think that even fiction, even the work of a novelist, is is essentially engaged with reality. I mean, you're a, you're a, you're a fantasy author, you know, and I really enjoy your work. By the way, I really enjoyed writing reading the uh, Song of the Syrian. I, I I think it's great, but you know, and it's fantasy, right? <laughs> but it's reality too. I mean, is, I would yeah. say so. It is. What you're yeah. doing is you're you're handling situations and human responses to situations, human ambitions, yeah. you know, all the stuff that's going on on in, in a fantasy world, uh, uh, a world that's built the way you're describing it, it's still reality. Yeah. And I think an historian, a historian is doing basically the same thing. He's working with reality. He's working with a human reality that needs to be told, that is worth telling in story form with a beginning, middle, and an end with a narrative in other words and whether the narrative relates things that have already happened but require the mind of a historian like saint luke for instance to sift through those and empirically pull some aside to include in his narrative or if the narrative is something of a of an author you know like yourself writing fantasy who is really inventing things that have never happened nevertheless the pattern is the same it's a it's a communication in narrative form of the reality of human life human experience with hopefully in our case as christian authors a spiritually significant um hopefully even salvific kind of purpose yeah absolutely um it's it, there's more i think we have more in common than most historians maybe are, are willing to admit and specifically i want to ask perhaps a loaded question but most historians will uh will well, and this is something that happened to me in my uh, in the University of California, Berkeley, when I was a student. But it was a cultural um, cultural history class slash literature class um, at the undergraduate level at Berkeley, and the professor was talking about um, Prince Vladimir uh, of of Kiev, and brought into um, basically what the, the subject we were speaking about was his alleged, as he said, monogamy after his conversion to Christianity. Because the idea that such a serial polygamist and uh, a man who loved women so much could then become loyal to one woman after his conversion, which of course, according to him, was entirely motivated by political uh, motiv well, by political um reasons he could never possibly have changed so much as to have become a monogamist and with along with that line of thinking i've written about this before in my own blog but uh, most historians nowadays will completely discount uh, the literature of the lives of the saints for example or any sort of miracle narratives out of hand how can an orthodox person um harmonize 
what is becoming more and more an empirical science history with the lived reality of the church, which includes what we might call legends. Uh, the church itself, in some cases, doesn't put a strict stamp of historicity on some of the lives, right? Mm -hmm. So how do yeah. we do that then? I think you, you, know, you brought attention to two problems, two issues. Uh, one is you know, specific to the case of St. Vladimir, but more general to all saints. And that is, I th I, I'm guessing, and, and you know, I, I don't know, but I'm guessing your professor has has about an axe to grind, certainly a, um, a view of human life that does not accommodate our Christian understanding of transformation, of spiritual transformation, of repentance and that's, transformation. That's for sure. That's that is, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what Vladimir experienced. So right off the bat, um, your, your professor, to use this example, was, uh, was not working with reality. Reality is transformation <laughs> possible. Reality yeah. is tra repentance can lead to a totally new way of life. Yeah. Um, and he was not working with that reality. He was working with a distortion of reality, which is, you know, uh, cynical and um, and suspicious of, of anything that looks beautiful, which, of course, unfortunately, is, is what, you know, it's in those hands that our culture today rests at most universities, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other question, I think, is just the question of the power of mythos, of, of, yeah. of a, an account or a narrative, a story about the past, maybe the life of a saint or more generally an event connected to such a life that that tells of reality, but it does so in a way that is not strictly speaking factual. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, any historian knows that at some point we are not factual because we have to put things together. R.G. Collingwood is a early 20th century um, uh, a, a kind of historical theorist, philosopher of history. I really loved, fell in love with his work when I was an undergrad, a graduate yeah. student. And um, he made a big point, you know, in his work that any work of history has to invent along the way because you can't take, you know, even in a, events in a short matter of time, you don't have every, you don't have a document for every single step, every second. There are, there's gaps you have to fill in with something. And so any historical narrative is going to be inventive in that sense. And, and so we're not even talking about whether we can be totally, completely, you know, photographically factual when we, when we write about history. The larger question, though, is are we telling the truth in a, in a, um, in a broader, deeper sense of, 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 of reality? You know, like, for instance, you know, the Orthodox celebrate the end entrance of the Theotokos into the temple. You know, on the new calendar, we just did that, and, and you'll be doing it uh, soon yourself on the on the on the old calendar. And and people often observe, like, how could that be? I mean, really, how could this young woman be brought into the holy of holies and stay there for years? And and that that's totally against all the laws, and you know, people would not tolerate that, and so on. I'm not really too concerned about that myself. Yeah. I really yeah. I'm not. I I think maybe it happened, and and but if it didn't happen, it's it's, it's so obviously a a statement, a narrative about reality. And the reality is, is that the Virgin Mary becomes the mother of God and uh, replaces the temple as being the dwelling place of God. Her womb becomes more spacious than the heavens. Her womb becomes, you know, the what the temple was just a pale image of. And, and, and like her, we also become um, the same. And the temple becomes that image of, of how we become um, the temple of God, which is, of course, is Pauline, you know, First Corinthians, right? So that's biblical Christianity. Yep. So that's okay for me. I don't have a problem with that. But I think a really technically kind of, um, kind of, uh, I don't know, but preoccupied um, historian who's inclined towards cynicism, cynicism might look at some of the saints' lives and start, you know, poking holes in them here and there because they just don't conform to his view of things or it, he discovers that there is in fact some invention taking place at some level. Well, it's not does just, that, does it's that not connect just, to what, what you're asking about? Absolutely, absolutely. But my, but it's, it's even deeper than that on some level because there's, you know, as, as you know, being a historian, there's the, there's an entire movement in the Catholic church to do exactly that, to, to do this massive sweep of the literature 
Rise of the Saints and poke holes in it and decide which is historically factual and which isn't. I'm talking about the Balandists, whose whose uh, project is ex extending to this day, as far as I can tell, and they think they've published something like, I don't know, 26 uh, volumes of, of revised Lives of Saints, where it very specifically says which events are factual and which, which events are not. In the process of 400 years of doing this, completely missing the point about reality, as you say, which is rather sad but it but this is something that that is some that is a reality that uh, that all of us i think have to have to deal with um and maybe some orthodox don't don't realize this and this can be a point um at which their faith might become undermined if they don't real if they think approaching the world from a strictly modern perspective don't realize that the way we have always looked at the world is not empirically and that, that that's an incredibly recent invention, and it's not a particularly good one. <laughs> not if it's exclusive, um, right? Not if it's exclusive. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, we Christians, I believe, are all about empirics. I mean, we're, you know, uh, an historian. I'll take my own um, my own work for, for as an example. I need to be faithful to the empirical evidence. I mean, I can't just, you know, <laughs> make things up, you know, just because they, they suit me or something like that. Um, you know, I need to be faithful to the reality of the past, but the reality of the past does not consist entirely exclusively, or as you just suggested, mainly in um, a, a documentable event that took place at a certain time in a certain place. Um, the reality that I'm interested in is, is, is it goes much beyond that, that merely empirical uh, evidence. Yeah, absolutely, and it's it's important that, that it be repeated because I don't think people think about it often enough. Uh, recently, and to to return the subject a little bit back to the similarity between uh, the world of fiction and the world of history, but I heard uh, about author James Rawlins, who's a, a multi best selling New York Times best selling author of various uh, religiously themed thrillers that do all kinds of terrible things with Christian tradition. Uh, he he recently signed a, a seven figure deal to write a, um, a series of epic fantasy novels. And as as I should have expected, the main bad guy is of course an oppressive church structure. Um, I, he hasn't written it yet, but in the basic uh, summary of, of where the series is gonna go, there's this young woman, which is the the hero hero of choice is, is, an, is a, nowadays is a liberated young woman who is fighting against the strictures of an oppressive church. Um, and I, I protested against this idea and, and the ubiquity of this idea in fantasy literature nowadays on my on my author page, and thinking that I would that would get a resounding yes, hurrah. But the the comments uh, to my to my um, to my comment were mixed. And one of the people who I have have a great great deal of respect for said said the following. He said, "Possibly you think this is a problem because many um, no." So I asked, "Why is it?" Why, I asked them, why is this a constantly recurring theme in our fiction? Shouldn't we have gotten over it by now? Um, and he says, well, possibly because many Americans have escaped from various fundamentalist or other cults that have widely damaging effects. Uh, you might be blinded, he said to me, by cradle orthodox privilege. <laughs> he put it in quotes. He was being cheeky. <laughs> uh, but, And he says, be grateful that you can't relate. So... Uh, and it kind of gave me pause because this is not uh, this person who said this is not somebody who who frequents and uh, anti-fascist websites. Uh, <laughs> this is a person who has who thinks deeply about life. Um, and so my question is this to you: How how does your book begin to address the the misunderstanding at, at the heart of this that a church structure is inherently oppressive? Well, I, you know, I think, first of all, without knowing much about, you know, the details behind what, what you just mentioned, you know, first of all, the, the goals and, and intentions of the author of this new uh, book, and, and secondly, the thinking of, of, your, um, uh, of your acquaintance, I think this sounds, as you noted, classic, right? It's just classic in our time, um, anti-Christian, anti-clerical, anti-church, Kind of theme, and and a lot of people pick up on it because it's become so, as you said, ubiquitous in our culture. It just becomes convenient, I think, convenient to have this as as one of the tropes, whatever it is, of 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 of, of writing. It, it does have an historical origin, though, doesn't it? I mean, Christianity became in in, in some places clericalist, where the laity. I'm, I'm writing about this. I mean, like. 
literally two hours ago, I was writing something about in my ch second chapter about the rise of clericalism um, in um, in the papal reformation of the 11th century when, you know, every historian agrees too. It's not just, you know, a, a kind of an ecclesiastical point of view. There was a real effort to reduce the laity to a passive role in Christian culture and society um, to establish a clergy um, that would rule it and that would give it, could kind of tell it how to live its life. And, and there are a lot of facets to this that are really interesting, but one of the a really, I think, culturally damaging result of it where it was it bifurcated the world into two halves. Again, dualism being kind of uh, awesome, uh, part part of what's going on here. Well, when that happened, and and obviously the Protestant Reformation, you know, to jump forward four or five hundred years, the Protestant Reformation was a reaction against clericalism. Of course, it brought a huge amount of clericalism itself, but but in some ways it succeeded as a form of rising up against what was perceived clearly, you know, clearly or maybe just intuitively as an unhealthy um, culture and society in which the clergy are in charge and the people are just passive, you know, just watching an audience at the at the mass or the liturgy or whatever it is, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think that that's a historical reality and therefore, you know, along with your, your, um, your acquaintance, I would say that, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I guess we can still continue to explore that problem i think we orthodox of course we have our own problems with clericalism it's it's going to be a problem in any biblical historical form of christianity but i think we have a lot of built-in safeguards against it for sure and as a member of the clergy you know well enough how humble we're called to be at the at the altar you know with prayers said by the priest you know that bring attention to his sins and make him unworthy he has to turn around and bow to the people and ask for forgiveness three times in the course of a divine liturgy um, for his sins, his unworthiness to be there. I think that stuff really, you know, he stands with the people, not facing them, um, but with the people in the divine liturgy, facing east along with them. Um, you know, we have a we have a, a very healthy and um, uh, safeguard against clericalism. I think for that reason, if we really explore the the the, the true character of our Christianity, our Christian culture. We don't have much to worry about when when it comes to people who are taking pot shots at you know at, at clericalism or the oppressive nature of a of the church in order to, to put together a probably a pop boiler like plot. You know, I think of the Da Vinci Code, how abominable <laughs> that was as a plot. Yeah. <laughs> We don't have any albino uh, um, assassins in, in the church. <laughs> well, I mean, James Rollins is very—he writes very much in the uh, in the in the tradition, if you can call, if you can use that that hallowed word of, of Dan Brown. But anyway, that's uh, who knows. It, it might become a a, a transformative uh, reflection of reality. You never know. He he might he, he might write something absolutely wonderful. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I I notice in a lot of conversations about our relationship to the world, whether culturally or historically or politically, oftentimes the, and I see this again and again, the sort of default reaction is is one of defensiveness against something that Charles Taylor calls secular two, which is the kind of anti, the rapidly anti-Christian of the middle of the 19th or even before the middle of the, uh, yeah, middle of the 19th, all the way to the time of communism, uh, the sort of, sort of traditional anti-Christian that we've all been, the boogeyman that we've all been raised to, to fear and to speak out against. But it, Charles Taylor in his book, um, A Secular World, argues that there's an entirely different kind of secularism that's that's uh, present, especially in the United States, maybe not in the entire Western world. He calls it Secular Three. And this is the kind of wafty, pluralistic um, relation to the world that that allows for the possibility of there being a god, but maybe maybe not. And it's not inherently antagonistic towards Christianity. It is inherent. It, it is antagonistic towards oppressive patriarchy or any kind of structure. But it does seem to be open to the possibility of transcendence, uh, or to transcend an experience specifically. Um, so my question is how how does how can the study of history help us have conversations with this kind of secularism? Well, 
Um, that form of secularism that Charles Taylor is focused on, and, and I, again, I think of what I assume is a, you know, some related, I think Schmemann, you know, he, he taught, he called secular, secularism the heresy of our time. It's, it's, it's a, essentially a heresy about man, right? It's an anthropological heresy that man can live without God somehow and just assign him to what Father Stephen Freeman calls, you know, the upper the upper level of the house where he makes yeah. noise up there from time to time and otherwise is out of sight. Well, that is part of the culture. It's part of the mythos of our time. I mean, it's, 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 it's a convincing, compelling way of understanding um, religion or, or deity or whatever you want to call it. And I think the study of the past shows us, you know, if you do it in a certain way, you, you see that that is um, untenable. It's just untenable. Um, and you, we can find a past, we can find a rich experience of, of, of a culture and a society in, in, in the West that, that, you know, for most of the time did not think that way, did not arrange its culture that, that way, but had a, a, a convinced, a, a, a strong sense, compelling sense of God's presence in this world. And that, of course, is what we've been talking about here, certainly what I've been yeah. talking about in the first millennium of Christendom, um, but it goes far beyond the first millennium. I think if we if we use history, if this is what you're asking, how can history address this this yeah. point of view, secularism three, um, I think that that's exactly what will liberate us, is to know that there is a, it really happened once, and it didn't just happen once, but it happened for hundreds of years, that a, a culture was viable, um, in which God was not just dismissed as a possibility and we just get on with a utopian kind of world without him, but God was really, he was part of this world. And and this world was enlivened by, illumined by um, his presence in it and made glorious and beautiful because of that. The, perhaps the biggest temptation, I think, of a, of a proper relation to the past is that one can begin to idolize it. So as a final question, how then in our attempts to create culture for this age, can we relate to the past in a way that wouldn't idolize it or in a way that wouldn't hamper us to repeat or to think that the only thing we could do is recreate something that was done before? How can we look to the future to, to make something perhaps new, but all the time looking back at the past as our guide? I think the gospel enables us to do that, Deacon Nicholas. I think that if we have a firm understanding of the gospel as it's been presented to us within the life of the church and, and uh, <clears throat> written by our members and, and canonized by our members and protected and defined by members of our church over the course of many centuries we have, I think the gospel is always going to bring us out of the idolatry of culture worship, which is always going to be a problem, especially in the context of culture wars. I mean, a lot of what's going on right now, if people are tended, tempted to idolize the past and turn it into an idol, is because things are so bad. I mean, I studied the history of, of Russia um, before the revolution, it was bad. It was really bad. Uh, you know, I called the book The Making of Holy Russia because every, you know, the term Holy Russia, Sviataya Rus, was being used all the time, but no one really thought it was there because there was so much apostasy. There was so much sectarianism. There was so much corruption. It was just so, that's why the revolution happened, actually. And, and I think the gospel will always enable us to see the past as it really was. And sometimes the past is beautiful and inspirational. I certainly think it is. I disagree with your professor at UC Berkeley who um, you know, tended to be cynical about it. I, I, I was surrounded by people like that, not only professors, but colleagues uh, throughout my time in the university. I see the past as a source of beauty and inspiration. But I, I think also, um, provided we can always um, measure what we're looking at, whether it's in the past or the present, by the gospel understood in the life of the church, we'll be safe. And I'm, I'm really confident we'll be, we'll be okay. 
Well, on that very positive note, um, I'm. I think we should bring this to an end. It, this was a very inspirational, moving conversation for me personally, and I hope it was for those of you who are still listening to us after one hour, and those of you who will be listening to this later on the YouTube uh, reissue of this uh, that I will um, send out to my uh, blog readers, uh, and I will ask Ancient Faith also to send it out to their own subscribers. But um, hopefully this is the first conversation of many that you will all be that you will all now be emboldened to have with other people uh, as you see the study of history is not something that is dry not something that is confined to the dusty halls of a university library but something that is vitally important for our very existence father john thank you so much for taking the time uh, thank god we finally managed to do it and it seems like that it it was on the entire time. I will find out later whether or not this is true. <laughs> but I, I want to thank you very much for coming out in spite of all the difficulties and, and taking the time to speak with me. Thank you very much. You bet, Deacon Nicholas, thanks for having me. I want to just observe, I, I just noticed a few minutes ago in my right-hand column here, there's a note from Ancient Faith Radio. Ask, feel free to ask John, Father John any questions. If anyone sent in questions that I might have seen. I, I didn't see any, and I'm sorry if I, if I overlooked them. I certainly wasn't uh, ignoring uh, that, that, that feature of the program we've been using here. But thanks so much for having me. It's been really nice. Well, I'm so glad. No, there were no questions. I, I think the, our, the audience was wrapped in attention, I hope. Uh, and if there are any questions happening later, I will be sure to pass them your way. Um, but in the meantime, okay. this is me signing off. And um, perhaps we'll have some more conversations in the future when book two will come out, which is hopefully not going to be too long in the future, Father John. <laughs> God willing. And everybody, please go to your local church bookstore. And if they don't have The Age of, uh, of Paradise, tell them to buy a whole box. It's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here.